It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18. Plus. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies. And today we have a special guest. She's actually a returning guest, Dr. Britta Bush now. She is a wife and mother and author of Transformed My Birth. She's a veteran childbirth educator, a celebrated speaker, mythologist, and specialist in childbirth relationships and parenting. And she is a co- former co-owner of Birthing From Within. And today we're diving into a deep conversation about her new book, Transformed by birth. I loved it. I cannot say enough good things about it. I loved it so much. I'm now actually adding it to the curriculum of one of the reading assignments for the prenatal yoga teacher training that I lead. So this is for pregnant people, for new parents, for childbirth educators, for doulas, for anyone that is in the perinatal community. What Britta talks about in the book is so transformative, as is the process of birth and parenthood. So I'm thrilled that you get to have this conversation. I just am so excited. And a little spoiler alert. So when I did the Crossing the Threshold training, which is from Birthing Within, I heard the story of Anana. And I asked Britta to give a very abridged version of it and how it pertains to the transformation through pregnancy and the ascent into parenthood. And it's such a special story and it really resonates with me. So Britta did tell again a very abridged story because I think the first time I heard it was like a half an hour. And Britta says whenever she does it, it's usually like an hour. So we have like maybe a five minute clip of her talking about it, but it's at the end. So stick around and enjoy that bit of the conversation. And if you're thinking, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's fine. Stick around and enjoy the conversation. But before we get to that, I wanted just to say a thank you to everybody that leaves a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this from, because it really helps people find the podcast. And I just was checking recently and there was really quite a lovely review left. I'm going to read it to you. It's from Well by L. She says, Best Pregnancy and Postpartum Podcast. Absolutely love this podcast. Such a well-curated and diverse collection of topics on all things yoga and parenting, and all of them so gracefully moderated by Deb Flaschenberg's incisive questions, warmth, and wit. So thank you. That really just delighted me. It made my day to see that. So thank you. Also, we've got some interesting things coming up. We're almost about to start the New York City teacher training. We've got a few spots left for the Richmond, Virginia. So jump into that. And then we're taking a break from the prenatal training over the summer. And Caprice and I are doing a baby and me and postnatal training in person in New York City. And then we'll start up again in the fall for our prenatal trainings. And then I've had people say, hey, Hey, I love the work you're doing, but I can't get to wherever you're doing this from New York or wherever it's traveling around. What else can I do? So for those people, we have a whole online library and I wanted to tell you about that. So we've got Who's Afraid of the Pregnant Yogi? And that is for yoga teachers that may not feel really secure or confident with the modifications for the pregnant person or even understand what's going on with that pregnant body. So there's an online course, Who's Afraid of the Pregnant Yogi? And I'm just releasing a new online course called Teaching the Postnatal Student. Just because someone comes back doesn't mean they're the same as they were before. In fact, they're just not. So this training is for that teaching the postnatal student, and that is going to be happening in April. You can already register for that. You can do that from our website. And then what else? So maybe you're not a pregnant person or you're not a a teacher and you're just a pregnant person. You want to learn and you want to have some classes and you can't get into the studio on the Upper West Side. So we have four 
one hour yoga classes for you. It's a little package. You can do that from our website and there's all different practices. One is chest opening, one is hip opening, one is squatting. So you can still enjoy practicing with us online, which is so great that we even have these abilities to connect with one another. If we can't be face to face, it can still be online. All right. I think that's enough of me chatting. So let me take a super quick break. And when we come back, I'm so excited to share this conversation with Britta. Enjoy. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Britta, I am so excited to talk to you. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so excited to be with you too. I know. I mean, what fun. Yeah. I so I remember when we got together in New York, it was so brief, but it was just so great that you were, as we were mentioning before we started our recording, our paths are so similar, which could be why I also, I read this book and I was in love with it. I have like notes in it and big like, yes, and little circles. And as I mentioned, I'm going to start incorporating this into my teacher trained curriculum. It spoke so loudly to me. So so, yay. <laughs> yay. I, I, you know, writing this book, writing a book is a very solitary, private, kind of alone experience. And as I was writing, I was, I was trying to picture who was reading it, who would be reading it and try to really speak to them. But at the same time, I was in a place of, I have no idea how this is going to be received. And so to be hearing some of this feedback now, it, it really, it, it makes those long solitary hours at my computer <laughs> Like, okay, good. Uh, it it was worth it. It, it really it's was. A long, it's a long labor. I mean, the number <laughs> of uh, metaphors I could use around birth for the process of writing a book are almost endless. <laughs> I can imagine. And would, I think it also because as we were talking um, when we met up was we both come from a yoga background. We both come from the birthing. Yes. I mean, you really worked with Pam. I have not clearly worked as closely with her, but it's the birthing from within methodology that just rings so authentically to me. And that has such, you really lean into that in the book. And maybe that's why I'm just overjoyed with it because it really, it takes away some magical thinking. We'll get into all that, but it's just, it's just delicious. So thank you for, Mm -hmm. thank you for the solitary hours and the suffering that you birthed (laughs) this book. (laughs) (laughs) It was, it really has been my pleasure. I mean, I've loved, I've loved feeling, I mean, I'm now in that postpartum phase, Uh but I am loving knowing that it's now out there. Yeah. So I guess let's uh, back up. What I am going to do when we do, when I put this out, I will make sure that our first conversation is linked. So some people already have a sense of who you are, but for those that haven't listened to our first podcast from... Uh, maybe it's a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, yeah, uh, fifty-four weeks is what it showed what up Skype on. Said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Real good. So uh, let's start with tell me a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to start birth work. Well, and I share this in the introduction of the book, but my first time sitting with someone in labor was when I was eight years old and my stepmom was giving birth to my oldest of my six younger siblings. And that was sort of that I didn't know that that would be the first of so many times that I would sit with somebody in labor, but that planted a seed. And then in addition to that, I've always loved storytelling, mythology, all of that. So that has played into my work. But I didn't think ever that I was going to be working in the field of birth. I became a yoga teacher after I was the general manager of Yoga Works in Santa Monica, back when Yoga Works was just a single studio on a little side street in in Santa Monica. And when I got, when I became pregnant with my now almost 20-year-old, 
my boss, Matias Rati, said, oh, Britta, you're pregnant. You teach yoga. I think you should teach prenatal yoga. As if the only qualification for teaching prenatal yoga was being pregnant myself. Um, but I, I took to it. I loved it. I was already teaching classes. I was already teaching the kids' classes. I was teaching adult classes. And this work really spoke to me. And yet I found that time after time, parents were coming back after giving birth and saying, no, 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 you don't understand my birth was really intense. And I was like, yeah, birth is intense. But somehow I had been communicating that you could just do a yoga breath to get through labor or that to do it, quote unquote, right, you needed to do it in this, that in a way that looked meditative or something of that sort. I don't know exactly what I was communicating, but I felt like I wasn't doing a sufficient job at really preparing families for how intense and transformative the process really was. And that led me to to reach out and take a class with Pam England, the author and founder of Birthing From Within. And taking that initial training with her, I was like, oh, this, this is home. This, this is birth work. It's spiritual work. It's personal growth work. It is, these are all the things that really matter to me. And then I found myself deep into that organization. I ended up becoming Pam's partner for several years and a co-owner with her and Virginia Bobro as well. And the three of us kind of revamped Birthing From Within. And then it came a time when that really needed to sort of come to an end, that partnership. And that's when I went back to uh, school. I went to graduate school and got a PhD in mythology thinking that I would be launching off and away from birth work. Yeah, famous last words. Instead, I found that everything in my classes was speaking to me through birth. And it was as if I was wearing glasses that were birth colored while I read everything or uh, filters on my ears as I listened to lectures. And that ended up leading to writing my dissertation, which was entitled Forceps and Candles, uh, Cultural Myths in American Childbirth, which ended up being the research phase really for this book. It's beautiful. It's funny. I, my husband says I do the same thing. I, I hear or see a story or a picture. I'm like, that's like birth. He's like, no, no, it's really not. I'm like, but, but to my lens, it is. And I think there are some of us scattered in this world that everything somehow relates back to birth. But yeah, yeah it just gets filtered through that lens. It's, that's that yeah. lens that we wear. <laughs> Maybe that's, yeah. So I just loved it. So I guess let's jump right in. Hmm. Okay. Let's start with the cultural message because I think that's huge. And I love that you're, it was called forceps and candles. Cause that's again, something we can dive into kind of, I call it magical thinking. Um, but let's start with the cultural message that we get about birth and the need for certainty and science and control. Yeah. So when I wrote my dissertation, I was really looking at what what is the mythological lens, meaning because because the program that I went to wasn't about a deep dive into Greek mythology, as most people would think when you say, oh, you have a PhD in mythology. It was more, how do you use a mythological lens on life and look through that and say, what are the myths? What are the stories? What are the what are the the mythological glasses that we're wearing that we don't even know? So I took that and said, "All right, let's look at this." And so the dissertation did some of that, and then and then the book I went a little bit further. And frankly, I could even go further and say yeah, even additional ones. I came up with eight, and these are now. First, I just want to say that there are many different cultures, even within. U.S., you know, the bounds of, of the U.S. But what I was looking at was what 
in another way, one of my teachers, Clarissa Pincola Estes, calls the overculture. So this is the the cultural messages that I pulled out are sort of that that those shoulds, those things that are sort of pressing down on us from the overculture, that that energy of this is what you're supposed to be doing. And so I identified eight. And the first one is kind of the key one that speaks to all of the rest of them. And that is the uh, desire for control and the need for certainty. So yeah, that one infiltrates the whole, all the rest. Mm -hmm. And right. And that's the, I mean, we, it starts as soon as we become pregnant, we're given a due date. And that due date is meant to mean something. And yet, what does it actually mean? We we hold, we're given it and we hold on to it and we share it like it means something that is predictable, certain, that gives us a sense of control. We start to plan our lives around it. And yet, in many ways, it's the first step of the illusion that birth is going to pop, which is that there is such a thing as control. And why this is important is that parenthood is going to test your ideas of control and certainty beyond anything you have ever touched or experienced to this point. And birth is an opportunity to start stepping into that, that we need to know about ourselves as parents. And so that stretching the idea that we have control and certainty and instead opening to the unbidden is part of what we need to know to be successful parents. Mm-hmm. So I that's completely agree. Yeah. So I went into that one a little bit more just because it's sort of the umbrella of all the other ones. Mm-hmm. So then I'll just want me to just run through them. Yeah. If you want. Yeah, they're yeah. just all eight. So yeah, then, there's mm-hmm. certain ones I want to slip into a little bit more that really okay. spoke to me. So I might jump in and be like, Ooh, let's, let's, let's flush yeah. this out a little more. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So number two is the veneration of information and technology. And so, I mean, that one sort of speaks for itself, but that's the the cell phone in the pocket available to give us encyclopedic levels of information at any moment. And the belief that that information will save us. That I want to, if we can jump in a little bit. So sure. I often really believe that education can help people have a more equal conversation, say with like their care provider, if they take the time to educate themselves about options, because if they don't even know the options, how do they even have them? But then I think what happens is they educate, they educate, they educate, and I'm here advocating for education. But then there's another step to that that I think sometimes gets missed, that we arm ourselves with evidence-based material, which is incredibly important because we don't want to just hear you know, hearsay. And then how can we have a conversation with our care provider if we're just using kind of antidotes? But then if we don't take that step to, yes, now we have that information, but then within that, we now need to let the river flow. I call, I wrote an article years ago called um, "Don't Push the River, Let It Flow." And so when I read your in your book where you talked like the banks of the river, I'm like, oh my god, we share a brain. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. how I think there. So I'm not sure if this is making sense, but say we arm ourselves with information, but then we hold that information for dear life. So how we can take that information, but still flow. Does that make sense? Well, yes. I mean, I think that the problem with information and technology is not that it exists. It has great value. The problem is the imbalance. The idea that information and technology will save us from anything else. And we miss the big step that is so important, 
which is transmuting information into embodied wisdom. There is a big difference between information, knowing information, and holding wisdom in our bodies. And that's the piece that I think gets missed. Mm. And so how do we take that that information and actually put it out of uh, statistics and charts and uh, bullet points and put it into our wisdom knowing and our body knowing in a way that we can access when we are in the hormonal bath of labor and postpartum. We have to be able to access that information and know when to use technology in a way that uh, can be more intuitively accessed because we're not in our usual intellectual brain when we are bathed in those hormones. Mm -hmm. So what are some ways people can access that? Well, I am a firm believer in storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think that storytelling helps to take information and put it into our psyche in a way that we can access when we are in a more primitive brain state. So that's a huge thing. I also think practicing. So it's one thing to teach about how to use your brain, you know, the brain acronym to get information. Great. You teach it. People are looking at it. They're like, oh, brain, got it. Okay. I'm going to do that. Cool. Then you put them in a role play and you say, okay, here's your doctor, here's your midwife and partner, you are now going to be asking all of these questions because, uh, Your laboring partner is now deep in contraction land and dealing with the labor brain, the labor brain hormones and labor land. So, you know, they're not going to be able to access that part of let me ask you all these questions, provider, that we think we will be able to. It's very unusual Mm -hmm. for somebody deep in labor to be able to access that part of their brain and ask all of those questions, even if ahead of time they have expected that they will be able to. Mm -hmm. That can be one of the things that after labor, parents say to themselves, why didn't I ask more questions? So we don't want them in that frontal cortex. Of course not. Of (laughs) course not. Because if they actually can, then that's a problem. Yeah. Often it is. And yet when we, as modern people, we're used to being able to access that part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, got it. I'm so going to be a badass. I'm going to go into my labor and I'm going to make sure I have all the information. I'm going to ask all the questions. And then when they get in there and they're like, whoa, I couldn't ask anything. They, they take that out on themselves. Mm. And it's like, Ooh, so back to to how to do this, it's like actually doing a role play where the partner has to go, oh, wait, um, wait, what are the qu- wait, what do I ask and how do I do it? And there's a white coat standing in front of me and now I'm supposed to use my brain in that way. It's like that is a different kind of knowing. Mm-hmm. That puts it into the flesh, into the tissue, into the experience, and that is needed. Mm. So we have to practice more than just sit and learn from, from, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. It's like, try it on. What does it feel like to be in that situation when the person that matters most to you is moaning or moving in a way that labor asks of them and you're trying to give them support while also being like, okay, wait, um, what did you say about breaking the water? Wait, wh- what? And feel that. What is that like? Oh, and like that, that can be really helpful. Yeah. That's a different kind of knowing. That is. I right, keep moving through the cultural ideas because I have some okay. more questions, but keep so, going. Number three is reverence for ordered culture over wild nature. Mm-hmm. So that one is the one where I get into Artemis and Apollo and kind of look at this is a favorite of mine and it it 
it's a little bit harder to explain and understand just in the, the line of uh, reverence for ordered culture yeah, over water. If, if you can explain. <laughs> yeah, Artemis- I need to attack that one a little bit <laughs> yeah. just to help it be understood. But the idea here is that we we live in a very Apollonian culture. So I use the Greek gods, the twins, Apollo and Artemis, to help uh, kind of give uh, a framework to understand these two things. So Apollo, so I'm going to get a little Greek mythology on you all here, but I, I think it helps. It's interesting and it gives an understanding without without vilifying or idealizing either side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I think that matters. Yes. So Apollo is a sun god. He's all about order and all the things that make culture feel cultured, civilized. He's a god of poetry and music. And those are things that often we think of as separating us from the animal world because we can do arts and culture. So he is everything that exists inside the bounds of civilization. But his twin, Artemis, is the Greek goddess of childbirth. And I go into sort of why she's given that name, but she is also the Greek goddess of the wilderness, sometimes referred to as the wilderness itself. She is um, untamed, is probably the most important word to describe her. She is all that is not civilized. She is a moon goddess. She is connected to the cycles of the of the day and night and the seasons rather than clock time, which is very Apollonian. She is the goddess of, of animals, life and death. She lives close to and of the earth. She is less about language and more about the sounds of the grunts and the moans. All of these reasons are part of why she is the Greek goddess of childbirth. But we, often in mythology and in fairy tales, siblings and twins are meant to be seen as two sides of the same coin, that they work together. The yin yang. So, The yin-yang. So here we have Apollo, which represents all that is cultured. And our culture, this this Western culture, is very Apollonian-focused. We love structure. We love focus. We love that, that feeling of control. All of those things matter to us. The wild, that energy of out of control, of of being an animal, of living in the night and in the dark and close to the earth is not what we revere. But there is value to both the Apollonian side, which is evident like with surgical birth. That is a very Apollonian type of birthing. It saves lives. We know this because you can look at at research that says, you know, places where cesarean births are not available to a point. There's that that midline between 15 to 20 percent, 10 to 20 percent, kind of in that range, depending that if if we have cesareans available uh, results go up. Survival happens more. If you go past that amount, then we get into another place. That's another, but, that's another, yeah, that's another topic for another <laughs> podcast, but in that spot. So we need that Apollonian piece matters. And it has helped us in our modern lives be very successful. But birth the reason I end up spending so much time in this chapter speaking about Artemis is that birth is far more Artemisian. And yet we're so used to existing in our Apollonian brain that when we then try and step into our Artemisian brain, we're like, wait, uh, 
I don't, I don't know how to do this. And this is unfamiliar and it feels scary. It feels uncomfortable. We need to head toward that, that Artemisian side so that we can start to understand that piece, that, that, that wild nature, that untamed quality, that less societally pleasing behavior. You know, um, I, I like to think of, you know, the, if you've heard of the, the hostess um, birther who's having a home birth and greets, you know, the midwives at the door and says, welcome, come in. I've, I've filled the refrigerator with all the foods that you want. And if you need anything, just let me know. That is, that is a home birther who is in their, their Apollonian brain. They're being pleasing. They're being societally acceptable. And most midwives know, oh, we got to do something about that because you know that you actually need to get into that other side that says, I don't care what other people are doing. This is what I need to be doing. And it might look like moaning and writhing and sounding like an animal. And that's what I was thinking, like when you were saying that Artemis is like the grunting. So I call it turning the corner where they go from the welcome, I have this to they stop, drop, and roll. Like they don't care. They've turned a corner and, and they go into that grunting and low and the, the movement is kind of prime. Like as I do this, I'm like swaying from side to side, you know, and it's it's beautiful to watch and, and it takes, and it's scary to the Apollonian side of us. Yeah. And so that's true. And that's what, yeah, in class, we talk a lot about like finding that sound and movement and getting comfortable with, with the unstructure. Um, I have all these really strange things. I have one I call it circling the wagons where I think about the birth attendants circling the, (laughs) circling the wagons, like creating safety. So the birther inside doesn't have to feel the judgment from the outside that they have that space to, to go wild in their own, in their own need, especially I find in a hospital birth, we need to protect that space because hospital births, again, I'm not demonizing. This is more kind of reality. They're, they're structured. So we need to find that protection. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and hospitals are basically temples to Apollonian values. Yeah. They're well, bright. They're driven by hierarchy and structure and, and, and speed, move it along. <laughs> and speed and a clock. Absolutely. And those are the exact opposite to Artemisian values. And so the reason I end up spending so much time on Artemis is that we need to lean into that because Mm. that's what birth demands of us. And so it's how do you, it's not demonizing the hospital. It's saying, how do you help make that space more accommodating to the Artemisian side that needs to be expressed in labor? Yes. So turning off the lights and, you know, making a safe space for somebody to really get in there, to go into the bathroom and moan and howl and grunt, because that might be where you're used to doing that. Those kinds of things. Yeah. It's, it's addressing it from a place of not vilifying either one, but understanding that, and all of these, when I look at the, the cultural ideal is what I'm, what I call them in the book, that's one extreme. And I'm, I'm saying it, it, it in itself is not a problem. It's that we need to find balancing energy to help bring us into a space where, where, we're in a place that is functional for both labor and new parenthood Mm -hmm. because birth is just a step at a process, a rite of passage into this far longer journey called parenthood. Absolutely. And it has lessons to teach us for that. Oh, it so does. I want, there's more I want to talk about the cultural ideals, but as I was going through the book, one thing that really struck me and I have actually been grappling with, and I've had this in years past and I've somehow I'm working through it. I had a student show up. This was maybe 12 years ago. 
And she did all her research and she hired the doctor in, in New York that has the lowest cesarean who I've worked with, who's amazing and will throw down everything to give her, give the student the birth they want. She hired one of the best doulas. She took the classes. She read the books. And as birth often does, it doesn't go as planned. And she came back and just, just stood at the desk. I'm like, how are you? And you know that like, it was just a, it was like a cracking of it didn't go how I wanted. It just didn't go how I wanted. And that's when I realized it's not about the books. It's not about the planning. It's about the letting go. So sometimes I feel like the natural birth movement can leave people feeling that they disappointed. And I, and I support natural, I, I support physiological birth. I, I do, but it's sometimes I feel like when we put so much pressure and effort and then we feel disappointed I call that like the magical thinking. So how can we help people not get into that and go to self-blame? She so blamed herself. I I did everything I should. I hired the people. I worked so hard and it didn't go there. Do you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. I mean, in, in many ways, what you've just shared, it was the inspiration for this book. So I think there is a lot of unpacking that needs to happen in understanding what a rite of passage really means. A rite of passage does not mean you do all the right things and get the exact uh, outcome that you're looking for. A rite of passage says, yes, you can prepare, you can do all of the things, and then there is a letting go. Because the ordeals that you will face on your unique rite of passage, you do not get to select them. You get to respond to them in the moment, in the best way you can. And that's that's really, it's the, it's that, how can you be both both uh, directive and interested and open to the unbidden at the same time. And that is really what makes birth such a unique rite of passage in this day and age. Mm, yeah. 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 It's- and and there's, there's a lot that you can do ahead of time. Much of it is, is work that needs to be done ahead of time to to come into that place of, I've done what I can do, and now my job is to let go. And self-blame still happens. That is sometimes part of the rite of passage as well. And it might be a parent's job to then discover what it's like to be tender with oneself even in our own suffering. Sometimes that's the lesson that we need to know to be a really powerful parent. Now, how do we hold our child when it doesn't go the way they want, whatever that is, right? Whether it's a musical recital or it's a play date or it's a birthday party they didn't get to invited to, whatever the the suffering is that faces children on a daily basis, how do we hold them in their suffering without being able to fix it? Mm. Sometimes that's the message that we need to learn through our own birth is how do we hold ourselves tenderly even though we're suffering and we didn't get what we wanted? How do we still love ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. I, the student that I, that I'm thinking of, it's still the, the look of just how she kind of fell apart at that moment. It's just, it made me realize I'm like, we need to not, we really can't set this idealized birth because it's never going to happen. Just like we love our children, but they're, again, we have, it's about control. We, we don't have control. We do not. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. You may, you may get to choose your partner. 
you don't get to choose your children. But even with that, like you cho- you choose your partner, but you don't always, I always say like, I can't, and I tell my kids is I can't control pretty much anything except how I respond to what's happening to me because and it's true. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you can't even control how you respond. That's true. Yeah. And so that, that tends to be the bigger issue is yes, we can't control situations. And there's a lot of talk about we can control our responses, but I sometimes say we can't even sometimes control our responses. Yeah. So when, when can we unhook our judgment about what happened? Is it, is it right away? Not always. Sometimes it, sometimes we have to judge ourselves for what happened. And then sometimes we judge ourselves for judging ourselves for what happened. And I don't know about you, but my chain can get long. Yeah. Like I, I can judge myself for judging myself, for judging myself, for judging myself. Yeah. No, <clears throat> this is so good. And it goes way back. So all we can sometimes do is find a weak link and unhook and go, ah, I really wish that it had happened differently. Yeah. I really wish that I was okay with how it happened, but I'm not, and I'm suffering. Mm. And then wrap that part of ourselves up in a tender embrace. Yes. I I want to take a quick break. When we come back, this is something big I want to talk about. I want to talk about pain in birth. That's a big one. All right, I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay. I said it. The big word, pain. <laughs> and birth. Yes. <laughs> and let's throw in fear. Another four-letter word, fear. Yes. All right, so. Oh, those are both good ones. <laughs> All right. So fear, pain, birth. Pain. Go. Yeah. So, so yes, pain is, uh, the vilification of pain is the fourth ideal I address. And pain is one of those words that has kind of become the thing we don't say about birth. We're like, oh, it's intense, or it'll be ecstatic, or it'll be orgasmic, or it'll be this, that, or the other. But we kind of don't say the word pain. And I think that's doing us a disservice. I think that we need to say that birth can be painful and that's okay. It's like, rather than make ourselves fear the word pain, what if we say, yes, birth might be painful and you are strong. What do you need to know about yourself? How do you need to prepare to meet that pain, to flow with that pain, to cope with that pain? Because sometimes it requires gritting and, and efforting and coping, and sometimes it requires letting go and allowing the pain to move and flow Mm -hmm. over and through the body. And those have two different energies. Absolutely. Flowing with pain and coping with pain are different. Yeah. 
that. Yeah. I call it like surrendering to, or um, my husband's a social worker, so he often uses the word leaning into, leaning yeah. into the pain. I'm like, yeah, I 100% Absolutely. Leaning agree. into the pain, surrendering with the pain. You know, surrendering is Working one of those- it and working with it. But working with it for me tends to move more into the coping side okay. because it's an act of doing. Okay, and I, I kind that. of see, I see that there's these two different energies because sometimes what is functional is not gripping and working with and, and coping through the pain. I where guess it's I think working with kind of like dancing with it, like where... Yeah. That's how I can. No, I mean it's yeah. it's all just semantics, and yeah. we can play with words. But but I like to address that there's these different types of energies that we need to do with the pain because sometimes it isn't actually hardcore coping. It's actually that letting go into that pain mm-hmm. and almost like getting the egoic self or the, the identity out of the way of the pain Mm -hmm. so that it does what it needs to do. Now, I'm so glad you said that because I've had students come back and I, I used to say like rushes and intensity until I'll be honest, until I had my first child, um, where I changed my language about it because I was in a great amount of pain. And there was a part of my brain that's like, I was like talking to myself. It's like, Deb, this is what you do. At that point I'd attended over a hundred births. I'd been teaching prenatal and childbirth education for almost 10 years. And I'm like, I was like, I was lying to them and I was lying to me. And cause I'm, I'm like, cause am I doing it wrong? Cause this is painful. So since that, I felt like I was right. lying to people and I want them to know that. And then I remember talking to Penny Simkin and she talked about the difference between pain and suffering, that they're also different. So when you started talking about, let's just use the word pain and not be afraid of it. I had like, like, being like, yes, in the book, because I do, I think we can set people up again for disappointment. If they're like, why isn't this, you know, ecstatic? If I'm not, you know, why aren't I having an orgasm during this? So I loved that you, that you did lean into that. Let's also talk about fear. (laughs) Fear. So I, this is one of my pet peeves right now, which is the whole idea that you need to head into birth fearless. And I disagree. I think that, I mean, birth creates some anxiety, you know, as, as one of my mentors, Pam, Pam England says, worry is the work of pregnancy. Mm. You know, it's part of, it's like that positive pregnancy test comes with, oh, wait, now I need to think about things. It's because something matters so much. When things matter a lot, anxiety and worry show up. They go together. So why are we are, are we why are we vilifying the fact that there might be some fear? It's like it's okay to have some fear. What does what do we need when we feel fear? We need to face some of that fear. We need to address it. We we need to build up in our belly and in our gut and in our heart some courage, some bravery to face that which we are nervous about. And parenthood is going to ask that of you time and time again. I'm at a very different end of the parenting spectrum right now in that I'm sending kids to college and off into the 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 lives that they wish to have and I have a child who is is very interested in making a difference in the world and he wants to spend his summers, he's studying Arabic, and he wants to send, spend his summers in the Middle East. And that is bringing up, you know, I'm having to do a lot of learning and a lot of letting go to face the fact that this is his path. And 
part of my job is to tend to my fears and my concerns and to embrace him in the life path he wishes to take. We learn those skills bit by bit along the parenting path, including fear heading into birth and labor. I think one of my favorite quotes, I actually have it right here. Birth does not ask you to be fearless. It asks you to be brave. I love that because yeah. like you're saying, it's not just the birth, it's that whole path yeah. out from there. I don't know if we have time for it, and I'm not expecting you to do the whole thing, but I think one of my favorite, not think, my favorite part of when I did the crossing the threshold training from birthing within was the story of Anana. Oh, I love that it's in the book because I loved reading it again. So if you can get yes. kind of a quick overview, but more about the descent, like her, her, yes. her, the outing of it. I'm like, that is a piece that I don't think we put a lot of time into the labyrinth, into the underworld, but we don't think a lot about the emerging. Do you mind? Giving a little yeah, bit. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I'm so grateful that Pam, you know, when I talked with her about what was going in the book and the various different things that I had learned from her that I really wanted to include in the book, she was so generous to be like, yeah, go this. I don't own this. Do it. And I'm, I'm so grateful that that she, that I, you know, so I share that from the place of uh, this is you know, the, the teachers that come before and how they influence us. And I'm a big, big believer in acknowledging our lineage. And this is one of those things that I got from her. And she, you know, didn't make it up. Right. Uh, it's actual. It, <laughs> you know, yeah. Inanna is, is a Sumerian story. It's a, she's a Sumerian goddess that, you know, comes from the area like the Fertile Crescent, the the place between the Euphrates and the Tigris in that place that we probably all learned about at some point in, you know, middle school, probably. Um, and it's, it's an ancient myth that went dormant. It was lost until tablets were found and it was deciphered. So it sort of has, has had a, a renaissance. Um, and so you want, it's hard. I mean, when I, I just taught a class this past weekend and I, te- I tell the story in two parts. And in the book, I also split it into two parts. And it's hard to do either of them quickly. <laughs> I know, I know. It, it's a long I, I, story. The whole, so. the whole thing when I tell it is about an hour. Yeah, no, okay. When when I heard it from the, the crossing the threshold, it was like at least a half an hour. So I'm like, okay, well, I know we don't have time. So I was wondering if there's any way you could like give the abridged. The abridged <laughs> version is actually what I put in the book. I had to work with my editors and my agent and everybody who, who wanted into the book, you know, who, who gets involved in the book, they kept wanting to cut it. And I was like, no, that was, they wanted, well, they wanted to cut it down. Okay. So I was like, ah, I don't know. But I mean, the very, very, I mean, it's almost uh, unfair to do a super abbreviated version of it, but the, the very abbreviated version, which I will do, is that Inanna is a queen of heaven and earth. She gets a call to the underworld to see what she has not yet seen, to experience what she has not yet experienced, and she must go. And so to start that journey, she gets herself ready She puts on all the things she thinks she will need, which is a lot like how we get ready for birth. We do all the things. We take all the classes. We hire just the right doula. We make sure we're at the right birthing location for us. We do all these various things. She does that. She gets totally ready. And then when she goes on the journey, very unexpectedly, there's gates. There's roadblocks that she has to pass through to get to where she is intending to go. And at each of those gates, the gatekeeper takes something of value from her 
takes her crown, takes her necklace, takes her bracelet, her cloak, all the various pieces. And each time something is taken from her, she has to ask herself, how do I keep going even if I don't have this that I thought I needed? That's the important part of this story is even if something is taken from you, something that you think you need, whether it's movement, like what happens if you aren't able to move in the way that you want to? What happens if movement doesn't work for you the way that you previously anticipated? How do you keep going even if you don't have access to that? So Inanna descends, being stripped away, humbled, being dropped into just this. All that matters is the process itself. She becomes that, just as most birthing people become labor. And eventually she does make it to the underworld where her sister is sitting on the throne and sees Inanna and looks on her with the eye of death. And in that moment, Inanna dies. And you could say that that is a little bit like the way it feels when you first look into the eyes of your newborn child. A part of you dies forever. You cannot go back to the person who hasn't looked into the eyes of your child. But the queen of the underworld doesn't care about that. And so she hangs the corpse of Anana on a hook and leaves her there to rot. Which is where I usually leave people hanging. Until the next time we meet to tell the next part of the story, which is the ascent. Now, Inanna, before she made her descent, gave a task to her very dearest best friend, Ninjabur. And she has empowered Ninjabur to do some things to watch for Inanna's return to make sure she doesn't get stuck in the underworld. Now, this is an important task that many of us could use to learn from, to to empower those around us to make sure that we don't get lost or stuck in our birth journey, in that journey of coming back to who we are after becoming a parent. That process can take some time Absolutely. And it's helpful to have people calling us back and saying, I'm still here. I want some of you back. So Ninja Burr does that. She also goes and she gets help. She goes to the elders and she asks for help. The first two elders, the first one is busy and can't be bothered because sometimes the people we go to and ask can't be bothered to help us. Another one has judgments about what Inanna did, and that sometimes happens too. Like people can't help us because they're so loaded with their own judgments about the choices we make. We can, they can't really help us full-heartedly. But eventually she gets to someone who will help. And from the dirt underneath his fingernails, Father Enki crafts the allies, the Kugar and the Galatur, and sends them to the underworld to help. And he gives them the food of life and the water of life. And they go to the underworld, and a series of events happens, and they're they're able to take the corpse of Inanna and give her the food of life, which is like the physical sustenance that is needed in postpartum, like food and laundry. There is so much laundry in postpartum. It's unbelievable. 
It is things like, let me hold your baby so you can sleep. The physical support that helps us come back to ourselves. But they also give her the water of life, which is like the emotional sustenance. Somebody to listen to us tell our story. Someone to touch our body, massage our feet and hands, listen to us, bring us back into a sense of an embodied being. These things help to bring Inanna back. And then she's like, I'm out of here. And she wants to head for the gates. But the rules of the underworld work differently. And the guards of the underworld bar her exit. She has to leave something of value to her in the underworld before she can ascend. What that is depends on the situation. Different people leave different things. Some leave a career. Some leave a creative pursuit or an academic pursuit. I sometimes joke that a clean car is still in the underworld for me. I mean, years and years of carpool and kids have made my car such a trash pit. And I'm waiting for one day when that won't be the case. But something is left down there so that we can climb back up. And at each gate, we get to take inventory of what we left behind and decide, does this fit me now? Maybe, maybe not. We can leave something behind as well. The experience of our birth journey, different parts of it slowly have to be shed as we climb back up. Blame and shame, grief, different parts of what happened to us gets left behind so that we can weave our way back up to the upper world. And we come out changed. We wear the mark of the underworld journey on our body forever. And we definitely wear it on our heart, our soul. We come back up. And one of the things that can be so tricky is that when we come back out, the world has been going on all on its own without us. And those who are even close to us may not even realize that we've been gone. That spoke to me when I read that. That was the part that really, I don't think I heard it quite the same when I heard the story the first time. But when I read it, because I think sometimes for me, I, I, I need to take it in differently. I remember for my first child, it was long. It was, it was several days. It started on a Saturday morning and ended on a Monday. And then I was in my house because I did a home birth. So I was home for a while. So I think it was maybe like two or three days later that I emerged onto West 72nd street in the middle of New York city. And my in-laws were like, go across the street and get a pedicure. You've been for five days. You have been really just in this apartment, just go. And I remember just opening the doors and seeing the cars and the people. And I'm like, life has gone on, but they don't know. They don't know what I've just gone through. And it felt, I didn't even know really how to cross the street for a moment. Like it just, it smacked me in the face when I read that. I, I'm like, I lived that. And we all have lived that. You emerge. Yeah. They don't know. They don't know what I just did. Absolutely. And I, I actually think also of that emergence as the emergence that can happen a year or two or three years later, where we finally come out of the transformative experience of becoming a parent, and we are changed, and we feel different, and we bump into somebody that we haven't seen in a little while, and we're like, this person doesn't even know who I am because I have been utterly changed by this experience. I love it. It's I remember, the dying to the yeah, former self. That dying just, to mm, the former self mm. and then being reborn to this new self. I remember the feeling of that with, with a couple of my dearest, dearest friends who didn't have kids yet and who I went out with them on a weekend sometime later. And I was like, wow, they really don't know where I've been. And, and 
don't get that I am an utterly different person than I was the last time we did this. Yeah. And and they couldn't. They couldn't know. Yeah. And that can be sort of a surprising moment to realize. Yeah. And that's what I think is sometimes missed when we talk about the whole crossing the threshold. It's not just the have the baby, it's the ascent after. And that I think that's why I was so craving. And thank you. Thank you for giving the very I mean, that was that, It was probably longer than you even anticipated. It's no, so it's about what I figured. It's um, so hard for me to do an abridged version. No, no, no. Of and I, I really appreciate it. You kind of hit the points I had in my mind. I'm like, good, she did that. I, I really appreciate it because it speaks so authentically. It's just like it screams within my heart to like be told. So the fact that you did, I, and as you were doing it, I'm like, I get to listen to this as much as I want. This is my recording. Like... <laughs> Like, it just, it just was, I, I really appreciate this and I appreciate your time. All right. I've used a lot of your time before we, and I'm going to take another break. And when we come back, one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new or expectant parents. All right. We'll be right back. Hello, it is Ryan. And we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Okay. We're back. And I know you've been doing this for like 20 years. So if you can whittle Uh, down. (laughs) I know. I'm like, tip. I mean, I, I, I have sort of a visceral response to tips because I feel, yes, we love tips. We love tips. Could your tip be go get transformed by birth? Yeah, but, but yeah, right. Go buy, go buy the book. Uh, go buy transformed by birth by Britta Bush now. Um, but tips, I, I think that this process of birth is bigger than a tip. So my, probably my tip is to give yourself space and time and depth to dive into the transformative experience of pregnancy, birth, and new parenthood without needing quick fixes Mm. or immediate tips because it's bigger than a tip. It's bigger it's more powerful, it's profound, it can be hard, and it can be utterly magnificent. But what it likely will be is transformative. Mm. And transformations don't usually happen on a dime. That was a great tip. So you did it. (laughs) Where can people find your work? (laughs) Oh, well, the book is available wherever books are sold. It's also available in an audio format, the audio book. And I read the audio book, which was a whole experience in itself, let me tell you. Uh, It's about 11 hours long, and it took me four days to record it. (laughs) So it's like, ooh. Um, And you can also find me on Instagram and on Facebook. Instagram, my handle is Britta Bushnell PhD. And my public Facebook page is also Britta Bushnell PhD. I have a transformed by birth uh, Facebook community so people can connect there. And my website is BrittaBushnell.com. So those are kind of the main things. Yeah. And I will link to all of that. So that I am just utterly thrilled that we had a chance to chat again. It really, I'm really thrilled that we connected so well. 
Oh, me too. And I so enjoyed meeting you finally in person I when I was in New York. That was wonderful. That was fun. And and I I love what you're doing and and really using the yoga platform and birth to be in this interwoven shared experience and and you know, I wish that when I was a new prenatal yoga instructor that I could have had somebody like you to help me know that there was a lot more more that I needed to know than just, oh, I'm pregnant and I am a yoga teacher. Let's let's do this thing. So what you do matters too. So thank, thank you, you so for much. having me Absolutely. and for what you do. All right. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.